Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. Welcome. So glad that you're here. We're going to take one more installment on this series for now before TA comes next week. So take your Bibles and we'll go to Genesis chapter 19 today. If you need a Bible, just wave at one of the ushers coming right now and they'll be glad to let you borrow one. You can keep it. It's our gift to you if you need one. So, um, Over the years, I've taken each of my boys on a father-son destination retreat uh, just for a fun weekend that they get to choose where we're going to go and what we're going to do. And I get to intersperse that activity with our sitting in the hotel room, lying on our beds and listening to some recordings um, about pubescence from family life today. And in both instances, it's been a great experience. It just sort of opens up conversation for talk about themselves and about their bodies and how sexuality works and everything. Well, with one of the boys, uh, we were lying there on our beds and we were listening to talk three, I think it is, where uh, they get very specific about the birds and the bees. And all of a sudden, this son in particular was calculating all of it and he lurched up and his neck snapped over at me and he said, Dad! do you really think I am old enough to be hearing this? And I tell you about that because if you have any kids in here today, they may ask the very same thing in this sermon. And uh, because in Genesis 19, we're going to talk about the threat of child abuse, gang rape, and uh, sodomy. And so if you didn't use our kids ministry and you say, I think I want to use it, this is a great chance for you to make a break and you'll be back here before we go much further and you can get them checked in and they're going to have an awesome experience um, as, uh, as they go to the kids' ministry here in the next few minutes. Now, we've been taking this journey talking about how God makes our path to purpose clear as we step in faithfulness, even as he's been doing with Abram. And we've been looking particularly at his life here these past several weeks. You'll remember The journey began for Abram with uh, Abram and his wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Lot. But nothing was going to happen. None of these great promises that God had promised to Abraham were going to happen until they started moving. And they had to move all the way from Ur, the Chaldeans, that was down near modern-day Baghdad, up to to, uh, modern-day northern Israel in land called Canaan. And... um, you remember from several weeks ago, if you were here, Pastor Dan told us, uh, the pat- went through the passage where, um, well, they've taken this circuitous route, unfortunately, uh, sort of a detour through Egypt that they oughtn't to have taken. But there they picked up a lot of wealth and they picked up a lot of animals and servants and so. And so finally they are settled where God had wanted them to be, in the promised land. But Abraham's clan is growing and Lot's clan is growing and their clans are starting to quarrel with each other. And so uh, Pastor Dan took us through that passage where um, finally Abram says to, to, to Lot, you know what, we, look, why don't we just separate? Look, there's all this land, you could go over there and we'll stay here, or we'll go over there, and you stay here. Abraham was even gracious enough to say to his nephew Lot, you can even choose. Which one do you want? Well, Lot, his eyes fell upon the luscious valley called the Jordan Valley. The Bible says it reminded him of Eden. It looked like the Garden of Eden. He says, I'll have that land. And he was guided by the lust of his eyes, as he and his clan headed off that direction. And that's where Abraham and Lot separate. And uh, that's also uh, where we find a lot of their trajectory began to go in different directions. Uh, I guess you could say, while Abraham was learning through victory and through defeat, we've looked at some of the defeats, how to walk with God faithfully. 
Lot was learning how to move away from God. And that's what we've got to look at today. Because down at the edge of this beautiful Jordan Valley where Lot had said, that'll be our land, there were a couple of cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wicked cities, sin cities in the truest of senses, cities that sat underneath a cloud of divine displeasure. Now, when, when Lot first moves down there, it says that he kept some distance from Sodom. You see that in chapter 13, verse 12. It says he didn't pitch his tents in Sodom. But then you get chapter 14, verse 12, and it says Lot has moved into Sodom. But before we go any further, uh, let's mention one thing that we're going to pass over today so that you have the context coming into the chapter uh, 19 today. And that is in chapter 18, God pays a visit to Abraham and Sarah with two angels disguised as men. And that is a preach-worthy passage, but we only have so many weeks, and so we're passing over that. But the end of that passage... Uh, God says to Abraham, well, now we better go on down to the Jordan Valley and we better check on your nephew, Lot, and see how he's doing down there. Well, of course, God knew very well what was going on down there in Sodom, and God wasn't going to go himself. He was just going to send the two angels disguised as men. And that's where we pick it up. Start in chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. He saw them, and he got up to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please, turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. Stop there. Where does it say that Lot was? Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Now, that doesn't mean much for us, but early readers of this text would have instantly raised an eyebrow. Here's why. A city's gate was the place, a prominent place where commerce and city government happened. Think city hall. He was at the city gate. That's where people would meet and greet each other and where disputes were debated and settled. The text now isn't saying that lots outside the city, or barely in the city. Now Lot is an active leader in Sodom. He's a mover and shaker in the politics and the commerce of Sodom. He's helping determine who's going to come in the gates and who's going to go out the gates of the city. And so Abram's moving towards God. Lot's moving away from God. To his credit, Lot still has enough of a, a spirituality that he recognizes there's something distinct, something unique about these two men. And so he bows upon them, something uh, godly he recognized in them. And he quickly invites them to his home. He says, sirs, come into my home, wash your feet, be my guest for the night. You'll get up early in the morning and you'll be on your way then. He's wanting to be hospitable. Chuck Swindoll points out that was considered a sacred duty and a privilege in the Middle East, still is today. But more than being just hospitable, Lot was also wanting to keep these guests in the city safe for the night and then get them out of town early the next morning. <laughs> Look what the men say in verse two. No, 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 no. We'll just spend the night in the square. To which Lot says, Sleep in the square. Sleep at the park. Oh, don't be silly. He knows something. You're coming home with, with me. You're staying in our home. He, Lot, prepared a meal for them. Verse 3 says, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. But then look what happens. Verse 4. Before they'd all gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. We're the men who came to you tonight. 
bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. What? This is Sodom's welcome wagon? Now, we know that Lot knew all along what this city was made of. And that's why there was no way he was going to let them sleep out in the park all night long. He knew this is a crazy city where I live. Now, in a city-state back that far in biblical history, you're probably talking about a, a city that's only a couple thousand people large. Pastor Chris Brown helped me to see something here. Verse 4 says, every man, young and old, went to Lot's home that night. Now, think about this for a moment. In a mob of, say, a thousand guys, simple math tells you most of them weren't going to get in on the brutal action. So why are a thousand guys forming as a mob around Lot's house? Because most were just coming to watch. We'd like to think we've come a long ways these days, wouldn't we? Don't be so sure. Oh, many won't ever do the sorts of things we're reading about here, but more people than ever are still showing up to watch wild sex scenes today. We just call it the internet. I'm not so sure our culture is so very different than Sodom at all 4,000 years later. Because most of them, they were just there to click and watch that night themselves. Lot, what has happened to you? Remember just a while back when you were walking with Abraham and you were following God? And how have you come to feel so at home in this city? Proverbs 4.14 says, do not enter the path of the wicked or go along the way of evil men. That would have been a good verse for Lot. Verse 6, so Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them. And he said, no, my friends, <laughs> don't do this wicked thing. Why does he go outside? Why does he close the door behind him? Because he knows that he's living in two very contradictory worlds. And they're getting ready to collide into each other. And they're irreconcilable. And he sensed what's getting ready to happen. And so he quickly scoots himself outside and closes the door, sort of like people today who kind of try to live in two different worlds at the same time. I got my heathen friends over here and I got my church friends over here, but never the two shall meet. And Lot doesn't want to lose any trust trips with his heathen friends because that's all he's got in Sodom. And so he goes outside and he's, hey, Hey, friends, <laughs> compadres. He's trying to reason with them in the heat of their lustful passions while concurrently he's closing the door behind himself so his church friends inside won't see what's going on as if they didn't know exactly what was going on and as if they really needed his protection See, Lot started out as a believer, but now he's only surrounded by people, people who aren't chasing after the things of God, people who don't care about God's word, people who are living in the dark, people who are broken deeply. And see, so you can't dance back and forth, friend. Between two worlds at the same time, it doesn't work that way. Oh, you can try, but finally the flimsy wall that you've constructed to keep your heathen world from colliding into your church world gets shaky and the collision is imminent. And now it goes from bad to worse. Verse 8, look, he says to all those men, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do with them whatever you like. But don't do anything to these, to these men here, for they've come under my roof of protection for the night. Now, in the Middle East, it's true that when you offered hospitality to somebody, you were assuming to, 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 to take care of them. You were assuming responsibility for their protection. But at the expense of your two daughters... 
this is crazy. This deranged proposal shows just how twisted Lot's world has become after living so long in this sewage pit. Lot's no longer living in Sodom. Sodom is living in Lot. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. If you try and play in the mud with white gloves, those gloves are going to get muddy. Either you'll be in the world and you'll be consumed by the things of the world, or you'll be in the world because you're on a mission to bring to that world God's love and his truth and his hope and his pure good news, but never to be devoured by it. But you can't be both. Verse 9, get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot, moving him forward to break down the door. They're saying, who do you think you are, Lot, you sanctimonious foreigner? Get out of our way. Now, until this point, the angels have not revealed their true identities. But now they're going to show their supernatural power. Verse 10, the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Verse 11, then they struck the men who were around the house, young and old with blindness so that they couldn't find the door. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? Sons-in-laws, sons, daughters, or anybody else in the city who belongs to you, get them out out of here because we're going to destroy this city. The outcry to the Lord against its people are so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But the sons-in-law thought he was joking. Want more proof that Lot, Lot has wandered far away from God? When he goes to warn his sons-in-laws, his sons-in-laws don't even take him seriously. They're like, what? We've never in all our time of knowing you heard anything serious come out your mouth about God. What, you want us to believe there's something spiritually different about you than us? We're made of the same stuff, Lot. Sadly, Lot had sold his soul to the culture of Sodom and with it any hope of being a compelling witness to the truths of God. Verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you'll be swept away when the city is punished. When Lot hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his daughters and led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. And as soon as he brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives now. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you'll get swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you've shown great kindness to me in the, in the, sparing of my life but I can't flee to the mountains this disaster will overtake me and I'll die look here's a a town near enough to run to and it's small let me flee to it it's very small isn't it then my life will be spared now think of this Lot believes the angels he believes destruction is getting ready to happen to Sodom He likes the thought of being spared, and yet he's dallying. He's not quite ready to move. He's saying, oh, I I just, I don't know if I can get this far from the city. I mean, I've invested in this place. My finances are here. My business is here. My reputation is here. if If I go with you, God, I'll lose all of this. He's trapped. He's trapped in his sin-fallen city. 
and he can't even see clearly anymore that life with God is always better. It's always better. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you have, might have it more abundantly. Jesus always adds a more to whatever quality you're enjoying right now. But let's like, I don't think it might be better. I, yeah, I want to leave, but I don't really want to leave. I've known people, I bet you have too, who said, oh, I, I want to follow the Lord but not if he were to call me to take a new job because I, I do not want to change professions. He's not going to ask me to ever do that, would he? Or I want to be saved, at, but uh, as long as I don't have to break up with the girlfriend because she's all I've got. Or I want to trust the Lord, but, but I want to hang on to this group of friends because uh, I like them. I want to give my life to the Lord. As long as he understands that my body is my body, and I'm going to do with my body sometimes whatever I want to do, and that's just not his business. Or I want to be saved, but I don't want to have to trust him with my finances. And I, that thought about giving back to God a tenth, a tithe of what he's given to me, and trusting he'll resupply that and more, I, that's scary to me. I think I'll hang back, people say. Friends, if we haven't noticed, our world is spiraling downward into destruction. And God is offering us rescue. He's offering us salvation through his amazing grace. How could you ever vacillate about whether to leave your old world behind when God is saying, I'm your only way out. I'm your only way to real life. Let me free you. Let me rescue you. How could you dally? But Lot, he was dallying. You get the sense that probably one or two of the angels were like saying to God, are you serious, God? You really want us to say this knucklehead? I mean, look at him. He's, he's trying to negotiate even as we're trying to get him out of here. Finally, verse 21, the angel said to Lot, very well, I'll grant this request too. I'll not overthrow the town that you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zoar. You want to flee to Zoar? Fine. But you've got to get out of Sodom now. Verse 23, by the time Lot had reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land, and then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew the cities and the entire plain, destroying all the living, those living in the cities and also the vegetation and the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, what did the angel said back in verse 17? They had said, flee and don't Look back. Lot and the daughters, they actually obeyed that one. They trusted God enough to take him at his word, and they didn't. They went forward, but Mrs. Lot didn't. Why? Warren Wiersbe suggests two reasons. First, perhaps she had heard Lot talk about his uncle Abraham and, and his God whom they'd followed from Ur of the Chaldeans. Perhaps she'd heard him reminisce about that God here or there, but clearly she had never come to know that God personally. She didn't know him. She didn't trust him. She didn't believe him. And secondly, she was addicted to her life in Sodom. She just couldn't leave it. When it says she looked back, by the way, it doesn't mean that she glanced back. I remember when I was younger, I used to think, man, that's so unfair. And she just kind of glanced and bam, you know, and what a bummer, you know. But, but if you understand the, the original Hebrew, it's not she glanced back. It's that she looked back longingly. That's what's going on. 
She was addicted. She was just like, I don't want to leave. I can't say goodbye to my old life. Friends, if you keep looking back, I can guarantee you'll always be dragged back. This past week, I was talking to a guy. uh, And I asked him, so how are you doing with porn? He said, actually, I'm doing great. I said, well, super. That's refreshing. Tell me. How is it that you're doing great? He says, well, because for a long time I wasn't doing great. I said, yeah. He said, see, um, in my early years of marriage, I kept lapsing back into the porn that I'd first encountered when I was 11. I said, okay. He said, it's, so probably like once a month, maybe twice a month, but you know, I would just have these lapses. And then finally, one day, I was being honest with my wife as I've tried to be all along. And she said, okay, here's the deal. You're destroying me with this cycle every time. Either you get all of me or you get all of that, but you can't have both. If you choose that, I've got to go. He said that was the day it was like God took a two by four to my head and all of a sudden I realized, what am I doing? Why do I allow this to continue to be an option? He said that was the day that porn no longer became optional for me. Because I've loved this girl for years, he said. And I just realized, man, I'm getting ready to lose this. He said, that's the day I'm choosing you, God. I'm choosing my wife. I'm not looking back. End of discussion. Case closed. He said, and the freedom that I've enjoyed since that day has exceeded any momentary pleasure I had ever experienced in the titillating highs that came through porn. It's like, that's a great story. The angels said, don't look back. This place is not an option for you, not anymore. Go forward. But she chose to be conformed to her old world. And she turned into the pillar of salt. Sodom and Gomorrah, incidentally, apparently started out as a very lush, verdant place. It's not now. They say Sodom and Gomorrah is most likely down right around the Dead Sea. And if you ever take a trip to the uh, Holy Land, to Israel, they'll take you down to southern Israel where you'll see this area. And you'll see, man, it is salt. It is dead. It is dry. It is crusty. That is all that's there. Incidentally, when we talk about um, Sodom, don't think that we're referring to one certain type of sin. I think Christians have made that mistake for years. To think that uh, narrowly about this is to miss the entire point of the text. No, the truth is that all of us have our own sin cities. All of us have our own Sodoms. Cities that we need to avoid. Cities we need to repent from going. Places that we need to flee from and never look back. See, nobody really gets a pass on this passage. This text applies to all of us. Now, with credit again to uh, Pastor Chris Brown, I want to talk briefly about three Signs that you might be inching your way closer to Sodom than you realized. Jot these down. They're good. Three signs you might be getting your way towards Sodom and you're just not even realizing it. Number one, prayerlessness. Prayer, lack of prayer, lack of relationship with God. See, Lot is in one of the worst predicaments ever. 
He's got a group outside his house banging down the door to commit gang rape. And he's offering to sell out his daughters. And he's getting ready to learn this city is getting ready to be destroyed. But what you don't read about in chapter 19 is prayer. Where's the cry out to God? Where's the repentance? Where's the Lord have mercy on us? There isn't any. There's no prayer in this passage. There's no walk with God. He hadn't been walking with God since he walked away from Abram, Abraham. I, I kind of pictured this week as I was studying a lot to be sort of like any number of people I've talked to over the years who say, oh, you're a preacher? Huh, just so you know, they say to me, I'm good with the man upstairs. I leave him alone and he leaves me alone. And, but I'm good, and you know, and, in fact, my granddad, he was a pastor, you know. I'm sure Lot was like, my uncle, Abraham, he was a really great man of God. Yeah, but yeah, what about you? I'm not talking about your uncle, I'm not talking about your granddad. What about you? Where are you with God? Beneath the goofy platitudes, Really? Do you have your own vibrant relationship with God? Do you have your own growing relationship? Are you talking with him? Are you studying his word? Uh, here's a question uh, for you, all of you. If you subtracted out the minutes that you're sitting in here for worship and that you sit in your grow group, if you're in a grow group, and I hope that you are, subtract out those minutes of time spent in prayer, time spent in Bible study, Take those two situations out. Now, how many minutes a week, how much time are you spending in your own prayer life or in your own devotional life? I think this might need to be a wake-up call that any number of us, we're, we're inching our way closer to Sodom than we'd like to realize. How did Lot get where he got? He just sort of put it all on autopilot. He wasn't working on his relationship with God, not after he walked away from Abraham. Even I had to take a look at my own uh, allocation of time. Several weeks ago, after the start of school, when we're back in the early morning routine and, we, you know, and, and Suzanne does this and I do this and the boys. And, I, and, and after a couple of weeks of that, I realized, man, Somewhere between the summer routine and, you know, late August routine, my devotional time is getting squinched out. And, and I realized I was, I was jumping up. I'm getting ready. I'm getting the boys ready, getting the food, all this, you know, and, and you know, doing the tag thing that we do. And, and, and I was saying to myself, I'll have my devotional time when I get up to church and I get to my office. But then people start coming in my office and it wasn't happening. So even I, the pastor, I'm just being honest. I'm just, I'm just saying, even I had to say, whoa, you know what? You got to break out of the, the, you know, you're back in this routine. I had to start resetting the clock for 5, 5.15 so I can get my time in with the Lord because I need about an hour in the morning just to spend in prayer and studying his word. And I can say all day, I'll, I'll get to it when I get up. It doesn't happen. Not nearly as often. What about you? Sort of the devotionless life. That's the first thing I think we got to watch out for. Because that's where the slippery slope begins in our way to Sodom. Second thing, lack of Christian community. Who did Lot have in his life reminding him, hey, Lot, don't forget you're a follower of the one true God. Don't forget who you are, man. We're, you're a child of the king. I'm praying for you, Lot. Who did he have saying these things to? Nobody. Nobody. He had no community, no faithful, what we call Christian community. He didn't have that. He was like the the coal that's been plucked out of the fire and set on the hearth all by itself, just growing colder by the day. He's all alone. 
And once the devil gets you singled out, he will get you picked off every time. Guaranteed. So here's a question for you now. Who are you doing life with? Who's your community of believers, of people who love the Lord, people who pray, people who are building their life on God's word? Who's those people in your life? Who's reminding you, hey, you've been saved by the blood of Jesus? Who's reminding you, hey, you know, these principalities and powers, they're coming from the devil, but we rise above that as, as followers of Jesus Christ. We know who wins. Let's live as victors. Who's saying that to you and who are you saying that to? Who's encouraging you? Saying, come on, brother. You're a child of the king. See, my concern is that any number of you, you we, we talk about grow groups. We talk about serve teams. We do on-ramp experiences. We just did a couple of them with the expo and the open house and all that stuff. But many of you are like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get to that. I wonder if that's kind of what Lot was thinking. I'm going I'm to get to that. I know I'm, I need some of that. You know, it's kind of hard to find the right people. You know, well, down there it was. But here it's not. Who's your community? Um, does this mean, by the way, that we ought not have any friends who are not believers? No way. No, we're called to be salt and life, light in this world. We, we are called to interact with our lost friends for the purpose of influencing them and bringing them to the life and love and hope and joy and peace and forgiveness that comes through life in Christ. So yes, we're called to, to interact and to bring them. My concern is not so much that Christians around Faith Bridge are isolating. Tim Keller, I think, uses three key words. He says, there's some Christians who say, you need to isolate yourself. Pfft, nonsense. That's not biblical. We just form a little hermit community and just the Christians. That's not, that's not what the, the word says. I'm afraid that most people, though, swing to this other extreme and they assimilate. They just fully assimilate into the culture. They don't look any different than it. Keller says, we're not called to isolate. We're not called to assimilate. We're called to infiltrate. We're called to go in in the name of Christ, befriending those who don't know him, but being distinct, being enough different, different good that people are like, you know, there's just something I like about you. Well, let me tell you what I think it might be. See, I got this relationship with God who made himself known through Jesus. And that is what makes me different. Not different, better. I'm no better. But I might be a little bit more in touch with what is transformational. And that's what I want for you. We're called to infiltrate. But see, Lot, he didn't have any community. He didn't have anybody who was grounding him and reminding him of, of who he was. This leads to a third thing. Influence, lack of influence. Not only did he have nobody reminding him who he was, he wasn't influencing anybody either. Not for the good, not for God's sake. So now here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself honestly. Are you pulling those people in your world closer to Jesus or are they pulling you farther from him? It's really not that complex. Are you pulling people closer to the Lord in your home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your sports teams, in your you know, kids' classrooms or your own classrooms? Are they pulling you away from him? If they're pulling you away, friends, you, you need to do what Joseph did when Potiphar's wife said, lie with me. What did he do? He fled. He was like, I got to get out of here. And that's what you may need to do as well. 
Some of you, you're already in too deep. You've already assimilated. Here's the real reality. If you've assimilated fully, you probably will never be the right person to infiltrate. You've probably lost that platform. Lot had lost it. You have to go in as an infiltrator from the start. Because if you've assimilated, you're already in the quicksand. Um, just ask Marlene McCormick. You're like, who's that? She was Marsha Brady. Anybody remember that, that old TV show from a more innocent era in our history? Some of us are old enough, we watched it after school. And, and she was a cute uh, actress that had all sorts of potential. And as her star was rising, though, she got involved in the drug culture, got addicted to cocaine and other things. I was reading an article that said, where she said, I actually was selling myself sexually just to get the stuff that I needed. I was missing auditions. She had an audition for Raiders of the Lost Ark. She missed it. She botched the whole thing. Out. She's like, it, it, it destroyed my life. She says an interesting thing. She says, in hindsight, I recommend anybody who's struggling, throw out your phone book in today's terminology. Delete those contacts from your phone. You're just going to have to cut them off. And you're going to have to say goodbye to some people that you've been hanging out with because you're not leading them where they need to go. They're pulling you in. And that may be the step that you need to take. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.15, there's some who will be saved, but barely, as those who barely escape through the flames, this was Lot. We're told in 2 Peter he was saved. Phew. Barely. Why? <laughs> Why was he saved? Because God is gracious. That's the only reason. Who can understand the grace of God? Who can measure the grace of God? Who can explain it? It's not deserved. It's not earnable. It's just, it's just something he pours out upon us because he's gracious, because he's loving, because he's merciful. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that nobody can boast. And therefore, you're eligible for it. You're eligible for his grace, no matter how far in you've gotten. For while we were yet sinners, the Bible says, Christ came for us. And he lived the life of sinless perfection that we couldn't live. And he died the death of punishment that we deserved and he conquered the grave that we would never conquer on our own. And he gives us that resurrection power if we just put our faith in him. So my question is, have you trusted in him? Have you received his grace into your life? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. My hope and my prayer is that you would step into Christ. And some of you, you say, I, I, I did step into Christ, but boy, am I kind of like Lot. I've stepped far away. Come back. Repent, turn. And say, I want to come back. I want to live in the grace that God offers. Because life with Christ, the rescued life, it's just better. It's just better, better, better. If you don't believe me, ask some of the people who were baptized last Sunday at our baptism service. It was great. Take a look at the screen and you can hear some of their stories right now. So my friend David beside me came to Christ when he was about 10 years old as a kid, but he has lived most of his life on his own terms. 
This is my sweet friend, Amanda. I'm just really excited to introduce her today. She has such a beautiful testimony that is a beautiful picture of God's heart for redemption and grace. Uh, Mike is someone that encourages a lot of people that are in ministry because he's growing and he's excited. Uh, he believed in God growing up, but he really didn't have any information on him. I uh, didn't know anything about Jesus. And it took actually his daughter asking questions about why people were at her preschool um, on Sundays in large amounts. And he said, well, they, they learn on Sundays about God. And she asked, what did they learn? He didn't have answers right away, so he decided he would get back into church and figure out some of those things. And along the way, about two and a half years, he's been at Faith Bridge now. Um, and through that process, he's come to a surrendered uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Her older brother had passed a few years ago, and afterwards she felt doubt and confusion and felt unsure that God's goodness was true for her life. Um, in the wake of losing her brother, Amanda's family faced a major restructuring where she found herself taking care of her older brother's son as her own. And seeking to answer Josh's questions about death and God and heaven, they found themselves at Faith Bridge. And as soon as she walked in, she said she felt welcomed and invited in and loved. And it was this answered prayer of community and family that renewed her desire to explore the gospel and see what it really meant for her. And then at a Maundy Thursday service, Amanda accepted the abundant gift of grace um, after she pictured Jesus kneeling to wash her feet. And the love and sacrifice that was entailed in that just really brought her to understand how much he loved her and wanted her. David, he's experienced a couple miracles in his life. More recent, uh, God has saved him from alcoholism. He's about 70 days clean. The Lord has moved him away from uh, decades of addiction. And he's ready to uh, be baptized, uh, claim to follow, and he is in awe of the thankfulness uh, that is, he's living right now. Her story has been rewritten with joy and peace and gratitude. And watching her love and lead and teach Josh has been such a gift. He knows he's not perfect and he knows he's not gonna be perfect, but he knows he can be surrendered and he knows he's growing. In her own words, she wants today to reflect and declare that she's been radically transformed by Jesus and that God is in the business of restoration and celebration. He wants to step into the water today because he believes it's truly the next step of his faith uh, to profess to everyone that he follows Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, my sense is that there's any number of people here today who need a next step. Uh, they need to turn. They need to say, I'm done with this. I'm moving out. I've, I just have a sneaking suspicion there's any of, number of people, even hearing my voice right now, you say, I am Lot. I've rationalized that I've bargained and I've danced around. I've tried to live in two worlds, but today's the day I've got to step out of that. I want to be with Jesus. I want to experience his grace. I want to be transformed. I want to be useful for his kingdom and for eternal purposes. I want to become a person who can infiltrate this sinful world with the hope and the triumph and the love and the light that Jesus brings into life. I know better than what I've been doing. God, I pray that even today, there would be many people who would step out of where they've been, that they'd step into the fullness of the faith and even into baptism in the days ahead, that they would say, I, I wanna be all in. I wanna be all in for Jesus and learn what it means to follow him so that I could be a person of hope, a person of purpose, a person with life, the life that comes through Jesus. If you're here today and you've never said yes to him in the first place, I just invite you right now in the quietness of this moment. Or even if you've said, I, I've trusted him, but maybe you just need to say, I'm, I'm recommitting, my, I'm coming back. You just borrow my words, Lord Jesus, 
here I am. I'm coming back. I'm coming to you for the first time. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I'm asking you to come into my life, to fill me full of your spirit, to give me new life, new purpose new hope, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, to wash me anew, to do a new thing inside of me. I'm asking for that in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, I just want you to do this with every head bowed. Would you just raise your hand just so I can see and look at you? Amen. Good. Amen. 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 Good. Good, good, good. Wonderful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, thank you for the good things that you're doing in our life. Won't you continue to do us, move us closer to you that we could walk triumphantly with you, God, resting in the power that comes through the spirit-filled life, not the sin-imperiled, plagued life. Fill us full of you. Give us victory, Lord. We're praying it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I'm joined today by Pastor Ken Warline, who just preached part six of our Abraham series called Walking the Talk. Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, We had a handful of questions that came in, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, The first one had to do with um, Lot and his particularly horrible decision to um, try to offer up his daughters in exchange for the men And I know that there's a lot of people in our audience um, who are uh, survivors of sexual abuse. um, And some of those uh, survivors, the abuse may even come from a family member, someone close and trusted. And so they hear about this horrible act that Lot did. And man, it's it's kind of tough to keep going with the story. It becomes a sticking point. And they're wondering why in the world is did God not do anything about that? Like, why is God giving Lot a second chance when he would do something so horrible? Um, So, yeah, why does Lot get this grace, but not the rest of Sodom? Yeah. Who understands these mysteries? Right. Well, let me, I think, let's try to answer it in two ways. First, let me answer it pastorally, Mm -hmm. as a pastor, uh, particularly if the questioner is a survivor of some sort of abuse right. uh, of, 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 in our own family or something like that, that would be uh, just particularly terrible. Mm-hmm. I think what we'd want to make sure that nobody mistakenly thinks the text is saying is that uh, God is against sin, except right. this kind of sin. And he kind of gives a pass to child abuse right. in this sort of thing. No, not that at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, just speaking as a pastor to anybody who is a victim of abuse, I'm just terribly sorry. And here at FaithBridge, we would want to do everything that we can do to help that person work through the pain, come into a season of rebuilding and healing and, uh, you know, journeying forward right. to the extent uh, that that person w- would like uh, help in mm-hmm. our prayers and so for that. Right. And let me answer it theologically or biblically. Mm-hmm. I think um, it's particularly difficult for us whenever there's a heinous crime right. uh, that strikes particularly close to home. Uh, For some, maybe that is a murder. How could any murderer ever be shown grace because my such and such was murdered, you know, or, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Uh, You know, and, and, or this sort of thing, this type of abuse or, or whatever. I think theologically or biblically, um, we stand on solid ground reminding ourselves that in the end, 
God is going to uh, vindicate us from every sin that has been done to us. He's going to settle uh, the score. He's going to uh, cleanse the world from evil and destroy the enemy me himself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we find some comfort in that. Sure. Now, as soon as we start saying, yeah, that's right, they deserve that coming to them, we come to that interesting passage in 2 Peter 3 where the Christians who were being persecuted in the early church 2,000 years ago are like, God, why don't you come and wipe out these Roman people who are persecuting us and hurting us? And, and Peter's having to remind them, hey, I know you would like for him to come and settle the score right. and be done with evil, but let's not forget the fact, the moment that he comes to be done with all of the evil in the world, we too will be done away with because we have evil in us too. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so Peter's reminding them, he's not being forgetful, he's being patient. Right. He's being patient so that more people can come to saving faith in Jesus. And so in that regard, we stand back and say, okay, I would like to think this person's going straight to hell, but I also like the fact that I am a recipient of grace. I haven't done anything like that, but I've done my own things. And he's being gracious. He's been patient long enough to come back the second coming so that I could come into salvation. Um, and there, but for the grace of God would go any of us. And so I think we have to be careful um, it almost sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I think I'm saying both as honestly and truthfully as, as I can, as I can mean it. Sure, absolutely. Well, and, and you know, what you said reminds me too of just like the scandalous nature of God's love, of His grace, of how much more expansive it is than uh, even we would like to think. Like we wouldn't like to think of God's grace and love extending to someone even like Lot. Um, uh, and, and you're right, it, it does serve as almost kind of a heart check um, for me in those moments uh, to remind myself like it's not about my justice sure. and, and whatever else. But then at the same time, you're right, God is on the side of the victim, he's on the side of the oppressed. Sure. And sure. It's just one of those strange... Well, it is. And it was strange even in Jesus' time. Uh, you remember uh, Jesus told that interesting parable about the, 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 the manager who had gone out and hired the day laborers. Right. And some of the day laborers uh, had come in and they'd worked a whole long day's shift and they're gonna get the reward that he had told them at the end of the day you're gonna get. Right. But then he does this scandalous thing, scandalous in their minds. Sure. He goes out and hires some, uh, somebody in the 11th hour. And so they put in a paltry hour of work and they get the same reward. And they're like, what's that deal? How's that fair? <laughs> and Jesus said, hey, wait a second. Yeah. Didn't I give you exactly what I promised? Right. And it's up to me if I'm gonna show the same measure of love and grace and forgiveness to him, that's, that's for me to decide. And this is the part of humanity that's difficult for us because we would kind of like to be God sometimes, but then right. we have to remember, no, wait, I don't, <laughs> I'm the recipient of grace myself. Right. And so we pray for other people who are far from God that they might come to know grace um, and that they would step into the fold of the faithful um, because we know it's either their evil and their sin will be dealt with at the cross through repentance or in the final destruction. Um, but it will be dealt with. That's good. And then another question came in from someone who wants to know, um, in a hypothetical situation, let's say in a work environment, if they've become so assimilated in that work environment, is it even possible for them to uh, infiltrate that work environment anymore? For Christ. Uh, for Christ, right. Yeah. Uh, is, or is there, is there no chance mm -hmm. left once you become so assimilated? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And it shows the person is, was listening to the message, and I'm glad. Uh, you know, I mentioned three things that we kind of want to check ourselves on. How's my personal devotional life? Where's my spiritual community, my right. biblical community? 
and who am I influencing? And, and so that you're asking this third one, uh, I think is great. I would say, well, let's go back and ask the first two uh, prior to it. In your devotional life, you're praying about this question that you're asking. I don't know who you are and I don't know where you work. I don't know the history, the dynamic, but, but, but God does. What's he telling you, I would say? Uh, what are you seeing in God's word as you're saying, what's my answer, God? Am I supposed to stay or have I lost the opportunity really to be a compelling witness? And I just need to pack it in and, and start over somewhere else. Right. Um, what's he saying? What's your spiritual community saying? What are your Christian brothers yeah. or sisters saying? You try it out on them and they're like, you're out of your mind. Sure. Yeah. You, you know yourself well enough to know you'll never, not with these people. Or maybe they'll say, you, you've got some Christians on the inside there. It, it, could you congregate with them and be fortified by them, checking in with them to make sure you're not relapsing back into the old crowd and the old ways? Um, what's your community saying? Right. God gives us these benefits um, uh, through prayer and through his word and through community. So I would put the question back to you sure. and say, what, what's he, what is he saying through that? The only, uh, I guess, broad stroke, uh, brush stroke uh, idea I would put out for you to ponder is this. If you have uh, learned a script, so to speak, and you've been going out on the stage and doing the same show day after day for 10 years, mm -hmm. can you really shred that script and right. uh, metabolize and own a new script with that same audience, um, it, with that same crowd. Uh, I think it could be possible, particularly if you have some other Christians, some other believers that are anchoring you in there and grounding you to remind you that's not who you are anymore. Right. Um, I do question if, you, if there's no other believers. I mean, if you're in there all by yourself and you got 10 years of history of being assimilated, I it may be time to just say, God, plant me in a different vineyard and send somebody else here. I blew it on this one, or I, I, I've come into a deeper awareness of you now. And but bottom line is I, I think I don't have realistically a great shot at making an impact more than they're going to probably pull me back in. Right. It's a great question. And it so is. we'll pray for wisdom for you. Yeah, it's one of the things that there's so many different situations that sure. Uh, the, the important thing is that you shouldn't be asking this question alone, right? You should be really? praying about this question yeah. be, and asking other uh, asking Christian God, brothers and others. sisters. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ken, so sure. much uh, for being here with us today. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.